Former state senator and attorney Penfield Tate is entering the mayor's race with an ad tonight during the Broncos game. He becomes the most prominent name to challenge the Democratic incumbent mayor, Michael Hancock. Penfield Tate, welcome to Next. Thank you for having me. First off, what is the most pressing issue facing our city and how would you address it differently than what Mayor Hancock is doing? You know, I think the most pressing issue uh, is uh, part of how the city relates to neighborhoods and people and giving them a voice in terms of how the city develops or doesn't develop, and then being responsive. Uh, and sort of tied to that is just open, transparent, and ethical government. You would hear the Hancock administration say, we listen to neighborhood groups a lot. We don't own parcels. We don't decide how they're developed. So how would a Mayor Tate do development differently? The city may not own all of the parcels that get developed, but the city's been involved in some controversial land swaps over the years that do impact neighborhoods that they don't appear to have listened to neighborhoods about. But what the city does is they can influence how development happens and how they encourage developers. And no, as I've traveled around the, 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 the city and talked to neighbors from different neighborhoods, they would tell you a different story. They would tell you that the city makes plans and comes and announces them, but they don't include neighborhoods on the front end. And that's part of the frustration. You certainly do hear a lot of conversation, a lot of frustration about the issues of growth. But I, I, I want to get down to specifically what you would do that is within the mayor's power to change the way that Denver is growing and developing. Uh, we would have to have a series of different conversations with neighborhoods and developers. You know, part of what, what we have of a t tradition of in Denver is prior mayors have uh, enabled and empowered neighborhoods so that when developers file a permit to do some development, neighborhoods get copied on the permit request immediately. And that begins a dialogue and conversation. That's been lost over time. As developers request variances of different types, neighborhoods are notified immediately. That's been lost over time. You know, part of the answer to this is sometimes how you treat people is more important than what you do. And part of the angst you're hearing and I'm hearing is people feeling that their own government that they're paying for isn't responsive to them, isn't treating them well, isn't paying attention. And basically, uh, as one person told me, we're gentrifying without a plan. We don't have a city plan. It doesn't filter down to neighborhoods. There's no comprehensive, cohesive vision for the city and to the extent there there are some things done they don't get executed well you have been thought to be considering this race for some time what now tells you that mayor hancock can be beaten you know the there's the sentiment in the city uh, i have traveled around the city and spoken with a number of neighbors not just people i know people i don't know and there is a growing discontent and People will tell you time and again, no one in City Hall is listening, no one in the mayor's office is paying attention, and they're not responsive. There is a dissatisfaction that is growing, uh, and I have felt some of that discomfort, which is why I started visiting and talking with people around the city, because I wanted to get a sense of whether this was just my own personal sense or whether it was something shared by a number of my neighbors, and it's the latter. People around the city are feeling this way. The gentrification, the disruption of neighborhoods, you hear it all the time. So this discontent that you talk about that, are you just hearing this from rank and file citizenry or are you hearing that from anywhere within the democratic power structure that is going to decide the election in terms of, of the money people and in terms of all the big names who show no sign of having any interest in anybody other than Mayor Hancock? Well, you know, I, I think that there are times when there's a disconnect often, um, and, and it's not necessarily the Democratic power structure that's going to decide this election, but there's often discontent between certain groups within the city. I mean, we saw it the last election cycle where, you know, Hillary Clinton may have been the Democratic nominee, but in Colorado, Bernie Sanders was the choice of Democrats at that time. And that was a, a dissension and a division that I think still carries forward to this day. And we've seen it play out in some of the primary elections leading up to this general cycle. Do you intend to make Mayor Hancock's personal behavior an issue in the race? You know, what I intend to do is address the issues that are brought into the race and that people talk about. And people I have spoken with have concerns about whether the mayor's office or the mayor's conduct sets the right tone 
for how city government ought to operate. How can you hold city employees who are valuable assets and valuable employees to the, the citizens of the city, how can you hold them to one standard if you act according to another standard? People want transparency, they want accountability, they want competence, and they want respect. And, and that's an issue, and people have raised it. You're telling me what you're hearing other people think, and I want to know what Penfield Tate thinks. Do you believe that Mayor Hancock has the moral and ethical authority to lead the city? I think Mayor Hancock's behavior, I mean, I've known him for many years, like other folks in the city, and like other folks in the city, I'm disappointed, and I assume that's why he apologized. And I'm disappointed with his behavior in office because you can't, I don't think you can effectively lead the city and tell people how to behave and how to administer government for the benefit of the citizens if you're not behaving properly yourself. It is an issue that, that I think is there, but more importantly, that I know a large number of people in Denver think exists. I, I want to drill down on this, though, because so the mayor admits have, making inappropriate advances towards a, a woman who's on his, uh, his security detail, a police officer. He's come forward. He's apologized for it. You say you're disappointed. There's a difference between being disappointed in somebody's moral failing and then saying that it's, that it's a serious issue that impairs the governance of the city. How do you make the leap from the one to the other? I don't think it's a leap. If you talk to city employees, they're demoralized. They're, they're concerned with what they've seen as a lack of appropriate leadership at the top. And other Denver citizens are saying the same thing. How do you assess the state of public safety in Denver right now? I think, you know, this, the state of public safety is we have some issues. And, and you can look at an arc of things over time from all of the large settlements we've been paying out because of over-policing and, um, you know, brutality and some other instances um, to rising crime rates, a spike in crime rates, some possible resurgence of, not possible, there's a resurgence in gang activity. Um, and we've had a lot of change in the safety department. Not all of it has been effective. I like the new chief. I think people have high hopes for him. The issue he had recently with the release of certain information, I think, gives people some pause. But public safety is a huge issue. So within, what, I'd say like the last 12, 18 months, we have a new police chief, we have a relatively new sheriff, and we have a new public safety director. Right. You have confidence in, in all three of them? Um, I don't know if I'd say I'd have absolute confidence in them. I think time will tell how they perform. But I think at this point, um, what we do know is we've had issues in the safety department that need to be addressed. And as part of this campaign and as part of this process, we'll be evaluating what's going on and, frankly, talking about perhaps some other ways to that the city ought to be behaving and handling the public safety function. The mayor has identified affordable housing as the number one challenge facing the city. You talked about growth more generally. Sure. They certainly have done some things on affordable housing. Critics will say it's not enough. What specifically would you do on affordable housing? Um, let me deal with the first part of your question. I think the city has done some things, but part of what I've heard and what I believe concerns people in the city is some of what they've done has been too little too late. I mean, uh, it, we're eight years down the road of this administration. The affordable housing problem, as well as the homelessness problem, didn't just happen yesterday or two or three months ago. So we've had a long period of time when this issue should have been being addressed, number one. Number two, um, some of the programs that have been brought about, the, the subsidizing rental payments, um, it seems counterintuitive to market forces. If you need rents to come down, you don't spend taxpayer money to subsidize the high rents. You sort of work with other private sector developers and get more inventory, and that supply should bring rents down. Uh, with the deed-restricted housing program, You've reported on a number of the problems there where no one in the city kept track of which houses were subject to the deed restrictions. You're telling me what the current mayor did. I want to hear what you're going to do. Well, what I'm going to do is sit down with affordable housing developers and sit down with neighborhoods because we've got to have neighborhood buy-in on how we do this. I also will look at the existing building code because I think parts of it are antiquated, and I think homeowners ought to be given a little more flexibility in modifying their current dwellings so that they can remain 
seen there and maybe make more space available or make it more livable or usable for their changing lifestyles over time. Are you talking about adding units to single family? Not necessarily adding units, but allowing people to do some modifications that perhaps may not be permissible now. Could you give me it's an example got, or two? Well, I'm you know, I, I visited some neighborhoods and they've asked the question, if we don't raise the height of our building above the existing elevation, why can't we come up with a building code that allows us to build over a garage, for instance, if you take care of ventilation and airspace and HVAC and water and a host of other things. There are some things that people in neighborhoods have been asking that I think need to be evaluated. And so my plan is to go into neighborhoods and meet with groups and talk with them about the housing stock and what they think can be done differently to relieve some of the pressure because we've got to address this. I meet with too many business owners in Denver who lament the fact that their workers have to commute from other communities because they can't afford to live in our city. Let's talk about the people who can't afford any housing at all. Uh, the homeless right. problem in, in Denver. The mayor has been criticized by some to his left for his his housing, his homeless sweeps. Essentially, they go into areas in the ballpark neighborhood and, and sweep people and their belongings out if they don't take their belongings with them. Would you continue that practice, and what else would you do as mayor? No, I, I think the problem with the sweeps as well as the right to rest is we're dealing with the symptom and not the root cause. We've got to look and talk to the um, transitional housing providers, the homeless providers, the various social agencies, because, you know, how part of the issue is not just housing and the lack of transitional housing. Some of it is tied to substance abuse issues. Some of it's tied to mental health issues. We've got to look at different ways to conjoining all of these services and providing them in a holistic fashion. And I'm not saying the government needs to do all of this. It probably can't and shouldn't. But there are ways to partner with some of the private sector providers we have now to assist and cooperate with them to help them be more effective. Last question, we have 30 seconds remaining. Do fees for developers need to be raised to finance affordable housing and other things the city wants to do? I'm not certain if fees alone for developers is the answer. Perhaps what we need to look at is not letting developers buy out of some of the affordable housing requirements we have now. All right, former State Senator Penfield Tate in the race for mayor. Look forward to having you back to talk about some of these specifics. Looking forward to it also. Thank you so much. Thank you. Subscribe to the next YouTube channel for the best of next and some other stuff.